The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. The word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and observe it. It's our blessing this morning to gather together and to study in the word of God, and we are studying commandments for the church. And uh, last time we left off and we were working our way through prohibitions. We uh, talked about this, that there are commandments given in the, in the Bible regarding the church, what is pertinent for us today, and many of those are given in the negative sense, that they are prohibitions, things we're not supposed to do. And yet, we want to always keep in mind that the keeping of these commandments is not a burden, at least it should not be. If we love God, then keeping His commandments are not burdensome at all, and And in fact, if we love Christ, we should want to keep his commandments. So it's not as though these are a rigid set of regulations that we're bound to. It's that these are the commandments from the word of God, and we should desire to keep these commandments. That's how you want to view this, as opposed to a rigid, uh, restrictive set of rules that you're obligated to live under. It's not like that. It's a set of commandments from the scripture that give us uh, guidance as to how we should live our lives, and we should desire to live according to those commandments. Now, before we begin our class this morning, it's important that we be uh, prepared for the study of God's Word. We have to make sure that we have no uh, unconfessed sins so that we're walking in the light filled with the Holy Spirit. We also need to take uh, a moment in this silent prayer to make sure that we humble ourselves before the truth of God's Word. Shall we pray? Most gracious Heavenly Father, your word is powerful and it is meaningful and it is important to us. And Father, I pray that during this time as we study the commandments that are in the scripture regarding us, that we would each and every one be focused on what it is that you have uh, prepared for us to learn today and that we would set aside all distractions and we ask that you would also be at work in our hearts to help us be humble so that we, we would be ready to hear these things and learn from them, and use them in our daily lives. We pray all of these things in Jesus Christ, most precious and holy name. Amen. Well, I was uh, reminded during my prayer that we're all supposed to be setting our phones to silent. (laughs) Mine apparently is not. Sorry about that. Um, So we have been looking at commandments... Prohibitions is what we're looking at at the moment, and this is what we were looking at last week when we wrapped up our class, and so I wanted to do a brief review, touch a few of these points. Uh, We should not neglect the spiritual gift we have received, and that's one of the things we want to keep in mind is that each and every one of us as a born-again believer in Jesus Christ has at least one spiritual gift. We learned that in 1 Peter. We, We all have at least one gift. And there are those who say that you only have one gift, and there are those who say uh, that people can have more than one gift. But nonetheless, we want to recognize that you have been gifted spiritually. Now, I want you to understand we're not going to go through and teach this in its fullness as we did earlier in this series. If you want to know more about spiritual gifts, we actually did a breakout study on spiritual gifts in this series. But one of the things you want to understand is is all of us have been empowered by God to do certain things. Uh, Now, we want to understand that there is a, the indwelling Holy Spirit empowers us to do whatever it is that God calls us to do. So you don't need to have specific giftedness in order to accomplish certain tasks. For example, um, coming alongside, encouraging one another. All of us are supposed to do that, and we're all capable of doing that in the power of the Holy Spirit. The who dwells within us. However, God bestows upon believers specific spiritual giftedness that gives us the ability to above and beyond that which every believer is capable of doing. You have a capacity to bear fruit in a certain area. And so that would be, for example, in the form of uh, maybe a lot of people think about this in the gift of giving. Well, all of us are capable of giving and giving in love and giving... Uh, to the glory of God, and we all have the capacity to give. 
but there is a specific spiritual gift that is given to certain believers that enables them to give in a way that there is an abundance of fruit that's born from that ministry above and beyond what would normally be done by a believer. So we want to understand that this spiritual giftedness is an above and beyond principle. It goes above and beyond that which no normal uh, capacity for a believer would be. But we shouldn't neglect that. So uh, as I talked about last week, that means uh, if you're not going to neglect that gift, then you should probably consider what it might be. Consider what that gift is. Uh, the primary way that you can neglect the gift that's within you is to not feed your soul. <laughs> if, you have no, if you have no spiritual food in your soul, then you're neglecting the spiritual gift that's within you. But I say it goes above and beyond that. I think you should actually consider what your giftedness might be. Consider what it is. You should, if you have an idea what your giftedness might be, talk to your pastor, talk to other people in the church about it. At some point when you become convinced of what your giftedness is, then you should pursue the training of that gift. It's not training of a gift is not just for a pastor or for an evangelist. And that's what I really like about Pastor Bob's ministry at Austin Bible Church because he has a training ministry and it's for any of the gifts. If you're a pastor, you go into the training for the pastor gift, if you, uh, the pastor teacher gift. If you're an evangelist, you go into training for that. But any person with any gift can join that training program and be trained in the use of their gift. Giving is a great example because you need to know how to exercise that gift. How do I exercise the gift of giving? Many people will jump right to the conclusion that it's, about, it's all about financial giving. No, that's just merely one aspect of giving in the church. So uh, you need to learn about what the aspects of that gift might be. So I recommend that you consider what your giftedness might be. And when you come to a place where you have a faith conviction and even maybe a confirmation of your gift that you would pursue the training of that gift. We saw that we should not sharply rebuke an older man. As we, we talked about that last week, but you know we don't have a lot of respect for the elderly anymore like we used to uh, in this society. I hate it. It's uh, one of those things that uh, I think we just, we just discard the older people in our society as though they're a burden and a, and a, a difficult thing for us to have to deal with. But instead... Uh, the people that are older have great wisdom, and we should, uh, we should respect them. And this is a, an aspect of respect for the older men, older people. And the, and the idea also here is a spiritual maturity as well. Not just older in years, but a spiritual maturity also. But it's, a, it's an admonition against a, a sharp rebuke of an older man. And then we saw that we should not receive an accusation against an elder without two or three witnesses. And the reason for that we talked about last week is that the elders of a church, elder is a, a term for spiritual maturity, and the elders in a church are targets of the adversary. And so it's real easy for the adversary to stir up strife and get one person to say something about an elder, and you're not to uh, receive an accusation on that basis. There have to be two or three witnesses to confirm what the person is saying, because it's just too easy for the adversary to make accusations. So uh, you, want, you do not want to receive an accusation unless there are two or three witnesses. Now this is, uh, this is a new material here. We should not promote someone to an office too hastily. Now that's more of a concern for the leadership of a local church than, than each and every individual in the church. But this is something you should pay attention to. You should know about this. And so, for example, if you see the leadership of your church promoting someone to a position and you are concerned that it's too hasty, then you should actually go talk to the leadership of your church and say, you know, are you sure, are you sure this person's ready for that? And the idea is, is too hastily is in terms of someone in their spiritual walk. Let's go take a look at that. 1 Timothy 5.22. This talks about the laying on of hands, but this is promoting someone into an office is what this is about. Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others, keeping yourself free from sin. The point is, if you promote someone into a position too hastily, they're not spiritually mature enough for that position, and then they basically fall apart in that position, they've... Uh, 
They've struggled and fallen into sin, and you're actually partially responsible for that, if you notice what it says, sharing in the responsibility of the sins of others. So this is just a uh, warning against promoting people too quickly. You should not do that. You know, there was a laying on of hands at my ordination, which, by the way, uh, six years ago on Friday, and the church's anniversary was actually yesterday, five years yesterday. We'll talk about that a little bit next hour. But they laid hands on me, and the laying on of hands, if you look at it in the biblical sense, the laying on of hands is a way that you identify with something. If you remember in the Old Testament, uh, they would lay hands on top of the animal. When they were bringing the animal sacrifice, they would lay hands on the animal, and then the animal would be taken and sacrificed. And what they were doing in the laying on of hands of that animal is they were identifying with it. So that when it was then sacrifice they had identified with the sacrifice of that animal now in terms of what the pastors did at my ordination in laying hands on me it was identifying with me they were identifying that i was one of them that i was a pastor among them at the ordination itself and that's why this term is used that way for the the idea of promoting someone to office or recognizing someone for office but it's not something you should do lightly you know, they, uh, there, were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of steps in the process before the ordination took place. And then, and then that was, my wife remembers better than I do. How long was that oral exam that morning? <laughs> What's that? I know it was three hours before lunch, but didn't we also have some time after lunch? Yeah. So, so they, they had this big production of an oral exam on top of a written exam. The idea was they didn't want it too hastily promote me into that position. They didn't want to recognize me as a pastor if they didn't, they weren't really sure. So this is an admonition against that, and we need to be concerned about that in a local church. We should not be disrespectful, or disrespectful excuse me, to believers in authority over us, 1 Timothy 6.2. Now, this is talking about masters here, but there's a principle, there's an application for us today. Those who have believers as their masters uh, must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren, but must serve them all the more because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and preach these principles. See, the idea here is don't... Um, don't take advantage. It's just because someone who's over you is a believer, that doesn't mean you can treat them somehow differently, right? You can't be disrespectful to them. It's not as though somehow the authority principle is gone, right? Yes, we're brothers in Christ, right? My, the, I've told you guys this before. The vice president of engineering at the company where I work is a believer. And so he and I are brothers in Christ. But... The authority principle still stands. He's in a position of authority over me. Now, it's at my job, but do I treat him differently somehow because he's my brother in Christ? Because I know we're co-equal in Christ. We're joint heirs with Christ and so on and so forth. Do I somehow now disrespect the authority that he has over me? I shouldn't, right? The authority principle still applies, even though we are both believers and we're equal in that, there's still an authority principle at hand. Now, this is an interesting, we should not be ashamed of the testimony of Christ, 2 Timothy 1.8. It says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Who, sa who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Well, now let's look at the idea here, ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Are we? I think we're all a little bit guilty of this from time to time because the opportunity presents itself to speak the things of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ and salvation through faith in him. 
And what happens? We all do it. I'm, I'm including myself in this. We all do it. We cower a little bit. And why do we cower? Because we don't know how people are going to respond. Right? We're afraid of how somebody might respond. Instead of recognizing the message that we're about to, li- to deliver is a powerful message of love, And it either is going to be received well or not. We don't have control over that part of it. But we should not be ashamed of it at all. This is a message that's uh, a matter of eternal life, right? It's a matter of eternal life. We have the opportunity to speak to someone about Jesus Christ. And often, sadly, we cower away. And so I'm not saying it's necessarily that we're ashamed of the testimony, but we have these doubts. We have these reservations. Are you ashamed in some way of your faith? Is there something about your faith that you, for example, have allowed the world system around us to convince you that believing in what you believe is foolishness? Hopefully you will not allow that to happen. But that's a way you can be ashamed, is you can actually be influenced by the people around us who say, well, only, only somebody who's a, a mental infant would possibly believe in that. You have to be weak in order to actually place your faith in, in those things. And do you buy into that? And if you do, do you become ashamed of what you believe in? It's a danger for all of us. We're not supposed to be ashamed of the testimony of Christ. Yes? I think uh, I have at times in my life been ashamed to to witness because I know that my behavior, either in the workplace or wherever I was, that I wasn't worthy. I knew that I had failed, and I was ashamed to then witness because they would say, well, who are you? That's a very good point. The point is that when we don't behave Christ-like in our own walk and people see that, then oftentimes we're hesitant to try to witness to someone because we we feel that they're going to look at us and say, well, you hypocrite. (laughs) How can you possibly witness to me about such things when you don't act like that at all? Um, The problem is that the shame in that case is actually with regard to your own walk. And, uh, but you still need to recognize that the, the message you're going to deliver is a powerful message. And there are answers to that. Of course, you probably know that now there's answers to that, that if someone says, look, I don't see you exactly, uh, walking along, shining the light of righteousness of Christ in your own life or whatever they might say. Uh, And you can say, well, you know what? Uh, It just is more proof that I'm a sinner that needs a Savior, and I'm thankful that I have one, uh, and his name is Jesus Christ. And you can answer that question, but I know what you mean. Yeah. You can become, yeah, you can become ashamed of your own walk, and that can inhibit the testimony of Christ. We should not split hairs and dispute about words. 2 Timothy 2.14 It says, remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. And you know, notice what comes right next, right? Right after that. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed or accurately handling the word of truth. This idea about wrangling about words, that can take a form, a lot of different forms. You guys have some thoughts on that? Wrangling about words? What does if mean? <laughs> well, or depends on what it depends on, depends, depends on what is is, but that's another story, but uh, another topic. But we can get we can get to the point where we can split hairs and we can have uh, differences among ourselves because of just merely terminology and communication. What was that? Yeah, the, yeah, I'm sure your children can, but 
But often, uh, often we have trouble understanding one another or we can't communicate very well because of differences in words, and it's not worth wrangling over those things. Uh, you know, we don't want get, to get into the, into the place where we're uh, creating dissension among the body of Christ over stuff that's not, not worth it. Yes, yes. Yeah, it leads to the ruin of the hearers. We don't want to wrangle about words. And I, I'm thinking of an example. I'm trying to decide whether or not I want to talk about it. But um, there was a, a while back, there was a, an article that came out. It was a journal article. It came out by Zane Hodges. And... He was writing it in a journal and was asking the question to seminary students, right? People who were in the training to be in the, in the ministry. And he asked the question, what does a person really need to know in order to come to faith in Jesus Christ and be born again? He was just asking the question. And in the journal article, during the conclusion of that journal article, he wrote very clearly that in my own witnessing, when I give the gospel, I make sure that I always mention the bad news, good news, right? The bad news before the good news. I always mention the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross. I always mention that he is God and man. I always mention that he was buried, he was raised, so on and so forth. He says, I always mention all of those things when I give the gospel. But I, he still was asking the question, but what does a person really need to know in order to trust in Christ and be saved? So the example I, get, I give along the lines of what he was thinking is, um, let's say you show up at, a, you showed up, up at an accident site, and there's a person there who's bleeding, and you've called 911, and the ambulance is on the way. And you can figure out pretty quickly that this person's probably not going to be alive by the time the ambulance gets there. And so you're talking to them and you ask them the question, do you know where you're going to go when you die? And they say, no, I don't. And you say, well, let me tell you, Jesus Christ died for your sins. And if you believe in him, you can go to heaven. And that person says, I didn't even know that. And you say, yes, he did. He died for you so that you can spend all of eternity in heaven if you'll just believe in him. And that person looks at you and says, I do believe in him. And then they close their eyes and they're gone. Now, I said nothing about the resurrection. I said nothing about his deity. I said nothing about him coming from heaven and dwelling in the flesh incarnate without sin so that he could be the substitutionary sacrifice. I didn't talk about any of that other than the fact that Jesus Christ died for his sins and if he would believe in him, he could spend all of eternity in heaven. And I asked the question that, ha that Hodges asked, is that person saved? I'm of the faith conviction that he certainly could be. Because in order to understand the process of someone coming to faith in Christ, you can't leave God out of it. So in those few simple words that I spoke, did God communicate to that individual what he needed to know to trust in Christ and be saved? Very possibly. And what came out of it, the reason I'm mentioning that here is what came out of it is a big, huge wrangling about words among the body of Christ. There were many people, and I'm going to use this word on purpose, there were many people who responded to his journal article and crucified him. It was ugly. It was wrangling about words and it was ugliness that did not need to happen in the body of Christ. So I was very ashamed. I was ashamed of my brothers in Christ that took that man to task for something, a simple question that he asked. So we shouldn't split hairs and dispute about words. We should always uh, find out what people mean, right? <laughs> find out what people mean and not uh, create dissension where there need not be any. We should not be stubborn. Oh, wait a minute. I need to think about this one. <laughs> we should not be stubborn, quick-tempered, addicted to alcohol, confrontational, or fond of dishonest gain. Titus 1.7. 
Now, this speaks about an overseer. We do know that the overseer is held to a high standard, right? I'm technically, if you want to talk about it, I'm not really the pastor of the church. I'm the overseer of the church, but if you want to use biblical terms, but because the pastor term is more relative to the giftedness as opposed to the office. But the overseer, that who, the one who is the, uh, the pastor of a church for the sake of uh, making it easy to understand, must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain. So pugnacious is confrontational. So I would say, don't you feel like this is a pretty good list for all of us? Right. I mean, remember that the standard that the overseers are being held to is a standard which does apply to all believers. It's just that in these cases where these are mentioned, these are very important characteristics because if a pastor is stubborn, that leads to problems. Wouldn't you agree? If you talk to my wife, she'll tell you I've got a little bit of stubbornness in me. Teeny bit. (laughs) Quick-tempered. Now, that's something uh, I would say the Lord has really worked on me with regards to because there was a time... There was a time when it didn't take anything to set me off because I told you before, I'm redheaded, used to be, redheaded, freckle-faced, blue-eyed, Irish, Scotch-Irish temper, and I used to be pretty quick-tempered, but the Lord's worked on that, and uh, I don't easily get, uh, get upset and angry anymore. Addicted to alcohol, you can see where, well, you can see where being quick-tempered would be a problem for a pastor, right? <laughs> Big-time problem. Problem for all of us, however. Addicted to alcohol, that's, let's face facts, that's really, uh, any kind of an addiction is bad. Because if you're addicted to something, then that means you are dependent upon something other than God, doesn't it? You have a dependency, an addiction to something, and it is uh, separate from your proper dependency upon God. So addicted to alcohol could be a problem, and certainly a problem for a pastor if he's drunk all the time. Confrontational. Pastor should be one that is one who soothes out and eases confrontation rather than one that stirs it up. And so one who's confrontational won't make a very good pastor. But again, remember, these are all good rules for all of us. No believer should be stubborn. No believer should be quick-tempered. What did the James passage say? Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, right? No, No believer should be addicted to alcohol. No believer should be confrontational. Now, that's important. So I want you to remember this. When you come alongside a believer because you feel like they need encouragement or maybe they need a rebuke. Maybe they need an exhortation of some kind. You are not to be confrontational. Now, what is the absolute ideal way to avoid being confrontational? Well, you pray. Absolutely. I agree about that. You pray before you go talk to someone but you function in love. That's the word you're going to hear me use a lot in this whole study. You function in love because if you're operating in love, then you're not going to be confrontational. Now, you can't, you have no control over how someone receives what you say. But that's different from being confrontational. Confrontational means that you are the one who stirs up the situation and causes the confrontation. And a pastor should, certainly should not be fond of dishonest gain. Very important for a pastor, but also important for all of us. We should not be fond of dishonest gain. Not be interested in trying to somehow make money in an illegitimate way. But I always go back, every time I read something like this, I always go back to a principle I learned years ago. If God doesn't promote you, you're not promoted. And that's with regard to financial gain. That's with regard to position at your workplace. It's with regard to... Uh, office within your church. It's with regard to anything in life. It's not a Bible verse you're going to read, but it's a biblical principle. If God does not promote you, you're not promoted. So you may gain something dishonestly, but have you really gained anything? 
No, you haven't actually gained anything at all. But think about a, a pastor who's fond of that sort of thing. That's trouble. He's in it for the money. We should not be argumentative with our bosses. Another one we got to think about, right? Can't be argumentative with our bosses, even when they're wrong. <laughs> Did I get the right verse there? Let's see, maybe I didn't. Let's see, maybe I got the wrong verse. Maybe it's 310 or something, 310. Maybe it is. Let me see. Yeah, it might be 310. Maybe I did a typo there. A factious man. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure. But the principle's there. That might make sense. A factious man, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, but the idea is um, argumentative with our bosses. We should not, even if our boss doesn't know what he's talking about, we should not be argumentative with them. We should not be... Uh, yeah, urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters and everything to be well-pleasing, not argumentative. That's probably it, 2-9. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Not argumentative. So if we, again, again, think about it from, from this perspective. If you're operating in love, if you're functioning in love, then you're going to approach your boss. And I've had to do this before, by the way. Um, not, my, not my big boss. Uh, who is the vice president of engineering, but, uh, you know, somebody who I was working for on a project. And they had made a decision on the project that I knew was a bad, a bad idea. I just knew it was. I have, I have the work experience. I knew it was a bad idea what they were going to do. And so the way I approached it is I went up and I talked to them about it. And I said, you know, here's what I think about that and why. And I explained myself to them very calmly and in love. And uh, in one particular case I can think of, the person who was in charge said, well, that's the way we're going to do it anyway. To which I said, okay. And we did it that way. And I didn't make another comment about it. It was the decision that they made. And we actually, it turns out, later on in the project, we ran into some problems because of that decision. And I did not say, <laughs> I told you so. <laughs> I did not say I told you so. Now, I witnessed in my office, and, and I'm not going to say, I am not going to say that it, there's a direct correlation here. I'm just going to tell you, I witnessed in my office, in our, in our offices at, at, at the building where we are, uh, we, in my secular job, we have uh, these, these offices where three or four or five people sit. It's a big enough office where you can set up separate desks and, you, you know, several of us sit together. The idea of it is collaboration, but I don't get along with those people, so I'm, ki I'm kidding. But, uh, but, uh, the, but the idea is collaboration. By doing that, well, I witnessed one of the people in my office, uh, the big boss, came in and was talking to them about something, and they didn't agree with it, just exactly what I'm talking about, and they became argumentative. And all I can say is this, when the next round of layoffs, they were one of the people that was laid off. I'm not sure there's a correlation between the two, but I can tell you this, it didn't do him any favors, right, that he sat there and argued with uh, the boss. And at one point, uh, believe it or not, the boss just said, he just said, this is how we're going to do it. End conversation. You know, that was, he just said, that's it. This is how we're going to do it, you know, because it had reached that point. But there's no, there's no gain in becoming argumentative like that. All you're doing is, all, what we, now tell me what we're doing when we're argumentative with our boss. What are, what are we doing? It's disrespect, and it's a lack of humility, isn't it? It's disrespectful, and it's a lack of humility. It's, again, not recognizing and honoring authority that's been placed over us, right? It's not honoring that authority that's been placed over us. All right, that's kind of a cool feature. Uh, we should not harden our hearts when we hear the things of God. Hebrews 3.15, and we're going to look at 4.7 as well. Hebrews 3.15, it says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. And if we scroll down to 4.7, is that what I did? Yeah, because the 4.7 
is uh, fixes a certain day today, saying through David for after so long a time, just as he had, had, has been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. So in this case, it's talking about hearing his voice, but isn't that exactly what happens when someone's proclaiming the things of God, that you're hearing his voice through his word? It's one of the reasons why I open up the Bible so much during a class and we look at so much scripture. You might feel like it's a sword drill, but the truth of the matter is the power behind any man's ministry is the word of God. If I'm not communicating to you the word of God, I'm not doing you a, I'm not doing, doing you a, a, the proper thing. I'm, I'm doing you a disservice by not teaching the word of God. So when you hear his voice, when the word is spoken to you, when you hear it, don't harden your heart. How can that happen? Pretty easy, actually. Because when you hear the word of God spoken and it pierces in, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, right? When the word of God gets you like a knife. How do you respond to that? It's easy. It's actually pretty easy to respond to that negatively, to become upset about it, to react and harden your heart and say, well, I'm not like that. Or you want me to tell you another way you can harden your heart? And I'm going to step on some toes right now. You guys will hate me after this one. You hear the word of God being spoken and it was actually intended for you and you, you actually sit there and think, boy, I hope so-and-so is listening. <laughs> now, you're now I'm meddling, yeah, now I'm meddling, that's exactly right. <laughs> I sure wish so-and-so was here to hear this message. Real easy to do. I'm not saying you've actually hardened your heart in that case, but what's, what has happened is that's a little bit of a blind spot. Perhaps you needed to hear the message, and immediately you thought of someone else. The hardening is actually a little more serious than that, to be honest. It's where the message hits home, and instead of responding to it with humility, right, humility and using repentance in the right way, a change of mind, Right? The word repentance in the New Testament means a change of mind. Instead of res- responding with metanoia, oh, change of mind, you harden yourself. And so your position that you have, which is actually a position that needs correcting, has become even more solidified, right? Because you've rejected the Word of God, which has pierced in and shown you in the mirror that it is. It's shown you exactly what you're like and you rejected it. So now that position has become even more solidified and hardened. And that, my friends, is what I believe is the scar tissue of the soul. Because as we rationalize those things, as we convince ourselves more and more that we're okay in that area, all we've done is damage our own souls and harden our hearts in the process. So we got to be careful about that, all of us. Sometimes the Word of God is convicting. I've told you the story before. I remember one day I was at Austin Bible Church and the message was very convicting. And instead of reacting in a negative way, which I typically would have, right, I actually stopped right there in the middle of Bible class. Of course, I didn't stop the class. I just took the time. <laughs> I let the class go on. But I took the time right there in the middle of Bible class to say a prayer and to thank God that through that message, he had shown me where I needed to be corrected. And that's the attitude we should have. We should be thankful for the correction from the Word of God because it is God's gentle and loving hand guiding us where we need to go. We should also not be sluggish. Hebrews 6.12 Verse 11 says, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now, what do you think it means here to be sluggish? Spiritually, this is what this is clearly talking about is spiritual sluggishness. What do you think that means? Yes, ma'am. 
Well, one way would be to forsake the assembly. That's true. Yeah, you just make a decision, you decide not to come. It's actually kind of a, it's kind of as though you've fallen into kind of a malaise, right? You've got this spiritual ambivalence, right? And sluggish means that you're moving slowly, right? It's a, the sluggish is, a, is someone who's moving slowly or not moving very much at all, right? That's the idea. Well, spiritually, you want to be advancing always, always advancing in the faith. You don't ever want to become sluggish. Now, I will tell you this. If you're abiding by verse 11, which is talking about applying diligence, if you're applying diligence, then you don't qualify as one of these believers that's sluggish. But there's going to be times, I expect you all to nod your heads when, you, when I say this, there's going to be times in your spiritual walk where you grow really quickly, and there's other times in your spiritual walk where you don't grow as quickly. It feels like you're not growing much at all. But let me, let me just see if I can describe this. <laughs> Let's give you a stupid analogy, but I'm going to give it anyway. Um, my wife and I, last spring, we, get, we bought a, uh, a, a, wood, a wood heater for the house, a new one. And we, we did so because it has, uh, we've, been, we've been heating it for wood, with wood for years, but, but we bought a new one because it was one that had a door in it that had glass. So we could see the fire, right? The old one we had was an old boxwood stove. And the only time you could ever see the fire is when you cracked open the door so you could throw in some more fuel, right? But we wanted to be able to see the fire because we wanted to be able to enjoy the, the fire in our living room. So we bought a new uh, cast iron wood burning stove. Well, it turns out, we didn't know this, it turns out that the oak, which is post oak, that's what we burn is post oak. The oak that we burn out there creates a, a layer of, I don't even know what it is exactly. It's not soot, but it kind of is. It creates this layer on the glass and obscures the vision. So we found that we had to clean it. So, And the best way to clean it, as it turns out, is to take some ash and put it in some water, and it creates a natural abrasive, and it's a perfect way to clean the glass. But where I'm going with this, you guys are sitting there thinking, what is he talking about? Where I'm going with this is when I go to clean that off of the glass, some of it just comes right off. But some of it I've got to sit there and scrub and scrub and scrub and scrub until it finally comes off. Well, that's the way it is with the stuff in our souls that we still have that is not in line with God's righteousness. Some of it God hits it with his word or he teaches you through a test or something of that nature and boom, it's gone, right? And you're growing quickly because he's removing that stuff from your soul. It comes off fast. Others, there's other things in your soul that have been there for a long time and have cooked on, (laughs) right? And are really difficult and it takes a long time for the word of God to scrub those things from your soul. And where I'm going with that is don't get discouraged when your spiritual growth doesn't seem to be as fast as you want it to be. As long as you're being diligent, right, which means you're you're reading the Word of God, you're studying the Word of God, you're coming to class, you're pursuing the things of the Word of God, you're diligent about your spiritual life, then you don't fall into this category of sluggish. That's That's just a part of your spiritual growth, that there's going to be times when it's seems fast and times when it doesn't seem nearly as fast. But sluggishness, spiritual sluggishness, is when we actually let our foot off of the accelerator. It's our fault, right? We lack diligence. We're not even really all that interested. As Heidi pointed out, we don't even necessarily come to the church, to Bible class. We skip out because we're not really all that interested or all that concerned about it. So we lack diligence. And we become very sluggish spiritually because we're not even really interested in growing in the things of God. So that's a sluggishness. We need to be careful about that. Um, We're actually already at uh, the time when I need to stop. So we'll come back next time and we will look at uh, the fact that we should not throw away the confidence of our faith. Now you should have new notes. Uh, I have uh, handed out some new notes for commandments which are in the positive sense. We haven't gotten to those yet but we will. So hopefully hang on to those notes. And as we keep on going through the study, we'll get to the commandments that are in the positive sense. But next Sunday morning, Lord willing, we'll come back and look at the 
the admonition that we should not throw away the confidence of the faith. And again, that fits right in with what I was just talking about. Sometimes we can get disheartened. You know, different things can happen in our lives, or maybe we don't feel like we're growing like we, we were at one time, or whatever else it is, we can lose confidence and become disheartened, and we should never lose confidence in the faith. Because what is, the, what is our faith? What is the object of our faith? It's God. And we should have absolute confidence in God. So that's why, regardless of maybe what's going on on this end of the situation, right, with, with whatever I'm going through, whatever's happening in terms of my own life, I should not lose confidence in, in my faith because my faith is in God. And God is absolutely and completely worthy of that faith and worthy of that confidence. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, that's true. That's a very good point. I hadn't thought about that, Marcia, that there's times where, where we may be going through a period of time where we're not sure exactly maybe what we're supposed to be doing or what, what, what are, what's happening in our lives and what's going on. And, and that may be a period where God is actually preparing us for a ministry door that's going to open down the road. So don't, that's a way you can lose confidence too, is you can not, not even know exactly what it is that, that God wants you to be doing, right? That, I, I hear that from believers all the time. I'm not sure what he wants me to do. And so just trust God. He's got a plan for your life. Again, it goes back to God, you're right, putting our faith and trust in God. He's got a plan for your life. And if you just wait, be still, <laughs> wait for the Lord, <laughs> and he will, he will open those doors. It is the hardest of all tests, I think, is to be still and be patient. But anyway, we'll close right here and then uh, come back to this next week, Lord willing. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, your, your word is such a blessing to us. It is the nourishment that our souls desperately need. Father, we thank you so much for the message that we glean from your word. Every time we open the Bible, we, we glean the truth. We have so many things that we can learn from your word. I thank you for this opportunity we had this morning to spend time looking at the prohibitions in the New Testament that talk about our walk of faith. And I do pray for all of us that we would not lose that confidence, that we would be diligent, never become sluggish in our walk. Help us, Father, to be strong in the faith. Wherever we lack faith, we ask for your help. Help us in our unbelief. And Father, we pray that you will continue to give us uh, the guidance that we need step by step and that we will be sensitive to that guidance. We just thank you, Father, for all that you have blessed us with. More than anything, Father, we thank you for the so great salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. And it's in his most precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.